I don't know how many uh, parts that we'll have to this series, but um, we're going to be talking a lot about history. And uh, I've had down through the course uh, of my ministry, uh, 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 folks who said, well, I either didn't get enough history or didn't like history uh, whenever I was in school. And of course, we understand that because sometimes it's just simply facts and uh, the like. But often, uh, especially grace believers, uh, are ignorant of the Bible and uh, its history, uh, especially in relation to the placement of its books. And so as we begin, that's what we're going to uh, try to understand, uh, that God not only has given us his word, uh, but he has also superintended the placement of his word in a certain order. So that when you start at Genesis and go all the way to Revelation, you are going literally from the beginning to ending of history as he sees it. So um, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. Now, I don't know if we'll get to it today. We'll do part one this morning and part two tonight and, and go from there. But we're also going to look at a page in your Bible. Now, some have said, I've read the Bible through. There's a page in your Bible uh, that is there and that you have never read. And there's a reason why, and it has to do with the historical placement of the books and the view God has of putting these books in a certain order and why there is this one special page. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. So as we begin then, we're going to um, look at the Bible, first of all, in three ways. We're in 2 Peter chapter 1. We think that the Bible is special here, but uh, there are more reasons than one as to why it is so unique. First of all, we believe that it's divinely inspired. Now, you hear people say of uh, certain works, uh, classic novels and, and stories and, and music and like, oh, they were really inspired. That is brilliant. But of course, what they mean is the emotion of the moment, um, the, the circumstance that has led them to produce such a thing. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But at best, it still has its flaws and, um, and uh, its inaccuracies, uh, such as it goes. But with God, we believe that this book is perfect, simply because uh, when it was being penned down by men, God the Holy Spirit superintended the writings. That means he watched over the shoulder of, of this guy and said, now you write this, this, and this, so that what we have is an er er inerrant book. Now let's go to verse number 20 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, it's wrong for any one person to come to any uh, part of the Bible and say, well, I think it's this or I think it's that, apart from understanding why God wrote it, uh, the context uh, and, and where it fits in history and all of those other things. Now, this is known as hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a science of literary understanding or interpretation. And just as we have to do that with certain books to understand them, God has done this to his word. That's why Peter says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. See, it's not man's will. It's not just man's writing. Though, though uh, there are uh, the personalities and vocabularies and, and historical circumstances there. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, the word moved there is uh, wind in the sails. We all understand that concept. Uh, the wind comes down, gets in the sails, and begins empowering the boat to move and driving it in a certain direction. 
And so it's that understanding that we have when we look to, to the Word of God and we see these men coming, what am I going to write? And God the Holy Spirit begins to empower them and push them to use certain words, certain phrases, uh, uh, and, and understandings that they have so that it's communicated, God's, God's mind is communicated to us through their writings. So the Bible is a divinely inspired book. But let's go back now to Psalms. 119. Psalms 119. And point number two. Verse 88. Now, another thing about this is that the Bible that we have is now closed as far as any more entries to it. Uh, we, we call that a closed canon of Scripture. We now live in post-canon circumstances. Now, a canon is simply a collection of, of writings into one book, and that book is called the Bible. And uh, the Bible has 66 books in it now, and those 66 books not only were given by God, point one, but they're also preserved. Uh, there are no lost books to the Bible. There might be lost letters that men of the Bible have written and mentioned about. But if those books were part of the Bible, God the Holy Spirit would have made sure that those books got into our canon. That's important. Uh, there's, so that we can have confidence in this work, nothing's left out. What God wanted us to know, He made sure was in this book. And that's what the psalmist says. Verse 88, Quicken me after thy loving kindness, and I'll keep the testimony of your mouth. It's God's word. He spoke it. Um, uh, he's the one who directed the very words. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness then to, to this word is unto all generations. Just as you have established the earth and it abides, they continue this day according to the, your ordinances, uh, for all are thy servants. And the implication is, just as there was an ordinance to preserve the heavens and the earth forever, the word of God by that same power is also settled or preserved in heaven. And uh, so when you come to, to this book, you can have utmost confidence that what is here, uh, God wanted here, uh, and uh, that we should understand it as such. But now we're going to add another dimension to this, a dimension we've never uh, taught before necessarily. And that is, in a third way, we believe the Bible is unique in that it's a divinely arranged book. That is, we also believe that God the Holy Spirit uh, superintended the placement of books in certain ways so that you can go from beginning to end. Now, uh, it is simple to prove this point. Where do we start? Genesis. What does Genesis mean? Beginnings. And what is the first word? In the beginning. <laughs> And you go all the way to Revelation, and, uh, and Revelation, the last part of the book, is the establishment of the eternal state, and it goes on forever. You go from beginning to end. And uh, we believe that God the Holy Spirit superintended the historical placement of books so that where we find the books in the order that they're given, now not necessarily or the order that they're written, because in some cases, there are some prophets who go back to the past, who speak to the present, and go to the future state. Uh, but, but what they have to say to that particular generation is placed at that point so that um, it all fits and there's a historical significance to it. Now, let's go to Luke. Book of, of Luke. And... Chapter 1. So note what he says. Verse 1. 
for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order. If Revelation were first and Genesis were last, would the Bible make much sense? Well, no. You could read it, but what you'd have to do is then put it in its order. And what God the Holy Spirit, we believe, did for us is inspire the very order itself. Just like Luke is saying here, things have to be in order. A declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us. There, there's a, there's a, a specific way they're arranged, which from the beginning were I ministers, ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, O oh, most excellent Theophilus. Why? That you might know the certainty of the things where you've been instructed. So God, having much more intelligence than Luke, understood that if men are going to make sense of this thing, you've got to start from the beginning and proceed from there to, to the end. And he's taken all the books now in the canon of Scripture and he's placed them. One, two, three, four. By the way, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but there's a little test in the bulletin uh, for anybody that's brave enough to try it, especially the minor prophets. Uh, have at it. Chapter 24 Chap of the book of Luke. Now, if Jesus Christ is going to give a survey, a gist of all that's happened to him, and he doesn't have a whole lot of time because he's got to, to ascend to the Father and the like, and he's given these instructions. Where is he going to start? How is he going to proceed? I believe he's going to start with the very order that the Old Testament canon, the Old Testament books were written. Note um, uh, Luke 24, verse number 25. O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, mind you, Moses was a prophet and he was the first. So he is including all of the books that have been written to that, uh, that uh, time, which um, in our uh, Old Testament is, um, is a Genesis to Malachi. But there is a, there's a rearrangement of the books. Uh, and we're, we're going to uh, see that uh, as far as the, the Old Testament canon is concerned, where these major prophets and minor prophets and these other writings were placed in a certain order following what in actuality was, was a, um, a pivotal book written. But it, all the prophets, everything that's been written to this point, note verse 27. Where did he start? Beginning at Moses. Who wrote Genesis. Moses, Exodus, Moses, book two, Leviticus, book three, Numbers, book four, Deuteronomy, book five. You see, he started with Moses. Uh, and, and then it says, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He started from the beginning. He understood that there was a, a, a specific way of viewing because from the start he was predicted about with the seed of the woman to the point where he fulfilled it about to go to the Father. And so he just simply surveyed the whole thing starting at the first book of, of Moses, Genesis. Go to uh, verse 44. He said, these are the words which I spake to you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, the first books, the prophets, the Psalms concerning me. He opened they their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now, Jesus Christ utilized the divine arrangement of books to enable the disciples to understand. You see, these guys were all versed in <laughs> these books. They had to learn the minor prophets and if they, they did, we're going to have to as well. All right, now, let's just take a little rabbit's trail here. And the reason that I do this is because a question um, arose on Wednesday night, uh, and uh, it, it came to us, a, a very genuine question, uh, where there was somebody who, who said, Job built the Great Pyramid. It's a, it's a, a fellow who is a... 
who has started a, another um, um, religion, a denomination, and the like. Okay, now the way to, that you can uh, understand that Job had nothing to do with the Great Pyramid of Giza is by understanding when it was built and when Job lived. Now, if we are where uh, the arrow says, you are here, and you count back 5,000 years, uh, uh, time and again we have that particular uh, date that is given us regarding the building of the first pyramid. Now that's what we've been looking at that and will on, on uh, uh, Wednesday night. We're going to see that there's great significance and that God is going to use the great pyramid in the kingdom. We've already seen the, those scriptures. It's really fascinating. He's going to use the Sphinx in Egypt and the great pyramid as one district and from it is going to start the way of holiness leading toward uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, Holy Land. So uh, uh, that is, is just really fascinating. But the fascinating thing about it is that it has transcended this great pyramid many, many generations and many people in the Bible. It was built around uh, 5,000 years ago, which puts us right in the heart of Noah's ministry. Uh, he wasn't building the boat yet. <laughs> uh, he, he hadn't started. Remember, it took about 120 years if the, those scriptures uh, uh, pertain to that, and they do. Uh, this pyramid was built. But you'll remember that men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took to them wives of all that they could. And, the, and uh, then part of the angelic race became incarnate and married these women and produced Nephilim and Rephaim. And these very strong, tall, uh, muscular individuals, they're called, they're called heroes, men of renown. Uh, and they, um, they wreaked havoc on the earth in those days. They were undoubtedly the ones that helped in building the pyramids. The mathematics, the astronomy, the strength, some of these things weighing, uh, weighing more than a, than a good-sized car were toted from hundreds of miles away. And of course, the technology of the day couldn't have done this unless there was help. We believe that's what it was. Okay, but now... Why couldn't Job have built the Great Pyramid? Because with Noah's flood, every human being was killed prior to that, and there were only eight people who came through the flood on the ark. And Job wasn't one. There was only four men. Uh, and uh, Job wasn't one of them. Job was a contemporary of Abraham and lived hundreds of years later or after the flood. And therefore, this is the significance of historical and dispensational study. Job didn't live under the dispensation of conscience, but under, under human government, under promise, uh, uh, probably. He was a contemporary, as I said, of Abraham. And so therefore, he wasn't anywhere near the Great uh, uh, Pyramid. This helps us to understand it. But I use this to begin telling, uh, uh, showing us that this is what God has done with, uh, with his word and his books. Okay? So let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we're going to show you this chart first because Paul uses this chart to give us a threefold division of the Bible. So, the first thing we're going to do is see how Paul views history in terms of the written Word of God. All right? Paul lived uh, uh, where we have that word present there. He lived close to where the two is uh, at the start of the dispensation of grace. And the green um, uh, uh, parentheses there and, uh, and the like are all, the green brackets are making it the dispensation of grace with the glorious appearing starting and ending this dispensation. But look how Paul does this. Ephesians 2 verse 11. So he's standing here, the dispensation of grace, 
and he's looking backward, and he says, Rem Wherefore remember that you being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh. Now, uh, verse number 12, that at that time, so as he's standing here, he's looking back in the past and he calls it time past. And that helps us to orient to, to God's view of us. What we were called, what happened, we were given up by God. God called another uh, a group of people called the Jews. Uh, and he gave them this, uh, this Abrahamic covenant with its token and the like. And so these Jews called the Gentiles, the uncircumcised Gentile dogs, and we were put away. Our only hope was to be associated with Israel. But Paul looks back and said, that's time past. That's, that's already gone. But look at verse number 13. He then, then begins to turn around and look at the current situation, what, what he calls this, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. All right, uh, hold your place here in chapter 2 and come to book of Colossians. Book of Colossians. And point number two, time past takes us to the past, but now takes us to the present. And as we saw in our first hour studying about water baptism, if you don't, if you don't understand that there is a past time and a present time and that there are two views, one now and one for, for then, then you are going to mix everything together and practice things that are not for today. Colossians 1, verse 23, says, Continue in the faith grounded and settled with the hope of the gospel which is preached to every creature which is under heaven. I, Paul, have made a minister for that, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you to fill up what is behind of the uh, afflictions of Christ for his body's sake, the church. Now, he was made a minister, therefore, according to the dispensation of God. This is where we live today, the dispensation of grace, which is given me to you to fulfill the word of God. There were scriptures for that time, and now Paul is saying there are scriptures for this time, as we'll see. His scriptures are for today. But let's move on. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, and here are two words again, but now is made manifest. So, time passed, but now. Let's go back to Ephesians. Chapter 2 again. And verse 7. So when you come to history, and remember, that's, that's more or less how we are going to approach this. It's, um, it's the Scripture's view of history and history's view of the Scriptures. And, but it all comes to us from God. The Scripture gives us these three divisions of history. And uh, Ephesians 2, verse 7. Now Paul turns and he looks ahead that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace toward us in, in Christ. So, uh, you have to know where you are in history. History is an important study, especially as it relates to the Bible, because to practice what they practiced under law for today is not just wrong, it is sinful, and it's to lead men astray. All right. Let's go to Romans 15. So in keeping with these three divisions of history, we're going to look at the three historical divisions of the books of the Bible. Now, we also are going to get down into some other major divisions, minor divisions, and even subdivisions. Which, which was appropriate because we're looking for a mini-sub to happen <laughs> in our property this coming week. All right. Romans chapter 15. 
Now, as we have settled these things, we're going to see that there are also three breakdowns of, of, of the books of the Bible in keeping with these. So you'll remember them. Well, what was for time past? Now, I want, what, what I want you to see, though, here before we read these is you remember where we said Paul was looking from? He is looking from his salvation, which is in 34 AD, backward. His salvation backward incorporated the first part of the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uh, all, all the other scriptures from Genesis to Malachi. Now, why is that important? Because Paul is going to consider the books that were written that cover these periods in history, Old Testament books. Well, you say, Pastor, that's wrong. That's wrong. Right here, if I, if I go right in the middle of my Bible here, just about three quarters of the way, I open it up and it says the New Testament. And the next book over says Matthew. You've got to be wrong. Yeah, some reformed theologian did that because he wants the New Testament to start in Matthew 1, 1 and the New Testament to be in effect for today. And it is not. Uh, that is more or less misleading and a misnomer. The New Testament will not be in effect until Jesus Christ starts his kingdom, Romans chapter 11. But uh, for convenience sake, convention, we, we just keep that, uh, that um, marker right there. But Paul, looking back, included Acts and the four so-called Gospels under the Old Covenant. But now what does he say about them? Uh, Romans 15, verse number four. He says that even, as gra even now as grace believers, we should learn about them. For whatsoever things were written aforetime or about history beforehand were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We can see what other believers have gone through, though they were under other circumstances and dispensations or economies. We can look back and see how that when people believed God, God was faithful to his word. That's the important. And we learn those things uh, that uh, Israel's launched out into the wilderness and God provided for them with the, the pheasant and the manna. Their clothes didn't wear out. The soles of their shoes didn't wear out. Uh, so we learn these things. However, they are not for our obeying. Turn to chapter 16 of this same book. And we're going to move now into the present. What books are primarily for our obeying today? It's Paul's books. We understand the past and the future by putting on Paul's glasses, as it were. This is how he sees it. And so as a grace believer, he is our apostle, and we now see things as he sees them. That's important. So verse number 25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, uh, which was kept secret since the world began. But here's our two words, verse 26. But now... You see, Paul's writings, this is uh, Romans 16, 26, Paul's writings are but now writings. They're for now, they're for today. They're, they're for what we're doing at, at this time. And we, when we come to the Bible, we can't just claim anything, it's just like yesterday. Uh, the, a whole the front page of, of one of the sections of the spectrum of the, of the courier was given over to the prayer of Jabez. Now, Jabez's prayer takes up about two or three verses, if that, in, in the Old Testament. And, and people are flying, oh, you've got to pray the prayer of Jabez. Now, if you buy that book and you read that book and you pray the prayer of Jabez, come to me later and I'll tell you just what I think of it. All right. Because it, you're, it's the old health, wealth gospel. 
He was coming down the line. He was in the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah. He was looking toward the land. What are faithful believers under that dispensation going to get as a reward? Land, wealth. I can put more cattle, more sheep on the land. Expand my borders, Lord. Uh, God says into his covenant, I will give you, Jews, if you're faithful, power to get wealth. I will give you blessing, overflow your, your basket, your, your herds, even your kids. You're going to have caboodles of them and grandkids. That's what Jabez's prayer is all about. But again, that's under the other economy. Uh, and people today just read it and, it, you know, they sort of lick their finger and open their Bible and put it right down here. Whatever verse it is, that's the verse they're going to claim for today. And that is nonsensical. It's a non, uh, non-intelligent, we won't say unintelligent, but certainly a non-intelligent way of doing it. That prayer of Jabez has nothing to do. Now, you can read it, but go ahead and try to pray it today. Jabez was under a covenant relationship of one of the blessed tribes, Judah, and, and, uh, and he was heading toward the land, and he could ask God for those things, and you can't. Sorry, here's what you have to ask. God will supply all my need, according to his riches, not all my wants. Jabez's prayer is a want prayer. God, expand my borders. He could do it. Your prayer has to be confined. Lord, you know that I need it. Supply it. Fine. All right, well, enough to pre preach in here. But now is made manifest uh, uh, by the scriptures, and note the last part of the verse, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Paul's writings are for our obeying. Now let's turn to, turn to um, 2 Peter. Now the reason we go here is because I want you to see that the Apostle Peter vouches for Paul that his writings are from God and should be included as part of the scriptures. See, that's, that's one good thing about uh, God. We, we come and we believe this one man, Paul, we take a lot for granted. What, what if he wasn't telling the truth? But the fact of the matter is, there are many, many people who witness to his um, authenticity. Now, verse 15 of chapter 3 of 2 Peter. We account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written to you. Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. But note, as also in all his epistles. These are the Gentile epistles. You see, it's kind of neat. We look to the future and, uh, and those things we have to learn. We have Hebrews to Revelation. We have the four gospels. We're supposed to look in those books and learn some things about it, but we're not to obey it. You can't obey the things that are in the book of Revelation. You can't do it. We're not in the tribulation period, but we learn about them. Now, in the book of Revelation, they're not going to be able to obey the, uh, the, um, the Apostle Paul. But are they to learn about him? Yeah, the reverse is true. They look back, and those scriptures are for their learning. So that's what he's saying. In all his epistles, speaking in some things which are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. Paul wrote under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, and his letters are, are right. They are inspired. All right, let's move then back to one more uh, portion here. 2 Timothy 3. Now, please note that when Paul wrote these words, all of the canon of Scripture was not complete. I had um, uh, Pete Allen to call me the other day. He had a man with him that has uh, uh, been a grace believer for a while, and we were uh, talking about uh, you know, the end time deals. And he said, well, Paul did this and Paul did that. And um, Pete tried to explain to him, and I guess he just wanted me to say it as well. Paul didn't have all the information when he died about all of history. 
Uh, when you come to the books of First John and some of these other books, they were not written as yet when Paul died. Uh, he didn't have a view of the few. As a matter of fact, there's only one book of the Bible, as we've maintained, that has the length of the kingdom in it dispensationally before the eternal kingdom comes in. That's Revelation. But Paul didn't read the book of Revelation. He was, he was with the Lord long before that book was, was written. But Paul understood there would be future uh, um, books to be incorporated in the Bible that were still scriptures. He's looking to the future, ages to come. And he knew that there would be books for those ages, those times. So he says, verse number 15, to Timothy, which, by the way, when Timothy was a child, he only had the Old Testament books. That from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, later on, Paul came through and led him to Christ with the grace gospel uh, on his um, uh, one of his missionary journeys. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we might be thoroughly furnished to all good works. See, looking back, we get comfort and patience of the scriptures. Looking ahead and seeing the terrible times of the remnant, that gives us motivation. Hey, we'll never necessarily face the things that they're going to face, and yet they come through with flying colors. We can be inspired and motivated by looking ahead. And then uh, we can be instructed and nourished uh, looking to his scriptures for today. All right. So let's just look at, well, with the time that we have uh, remaining here, let's look at a historical grouping, the first one that we have. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Now, as we do this, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time today on this first group. We will come back. But the reason that we're not going to do it and come back and spend a little more time on it is because by the end of the day, I would like to give you the one page of the Bible <laughs> that you have never read and why it's there. Uh, it is, it is so important and so significant to, to, to the scope of things. You have never seen this before, I promise you. You've, you've never seen it. You've never understood it. But all of a sudden, it's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. And you're going to say, well, why, why didn't I know that? Uh, it's because Christendom has tried to keep its uh, participants ignorant. We don't want to do that here. So we're just going to briefly give you this, this, um, this gist. All right. The first grouping here in, in the word is actually the way that the Old Testament canon, uh, Jewish wise, is arranged. It goes from Genesis to Second Chronicles. And it goes all the way through uh, historically. Here's where we start. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So it has to start there. So, surprise, surprise. God is smart enough to start where it needs to start. So that if we're, if we're trying to orient to his program, where do we go? Back to the beginning. And so that's how he set the book of Genesis, where things started and move out from there. But now, mainly, and, and like I said, we'll come back to this, this grouping of books. Mainly it has to do with Adam's fall, with the rejection of the Gentiles, with the um, uh, choosing of Abraham and his seed, and coming through to the Davidic covenant and the split of the, of the kingdom with Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and the two deportations from Israel, dispersions. Now, by the time we get to 2 Chronicles 36.20, we're going to understand 
that the second dispersion is about to happen and has, has happened. Now, what do I mean by these dispersions? Once Jeroboam and Rehoboam split the kingdom into ten tribes and two tribes, uh, God dealt with them as two separate entities. The first ten he took to Assyria before he took the other two. And Assyria was a captivity and Babylon was a captivity. And all along the way, he warned them and he warned them. He sent prophets to them and they rejected. And all of a sudden, we're here now through history at, at uh, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And uh, verse 5. Uh, by the way, Isaiah is one of those prophets that, that was warning. Judgment's coming, judgment's coming, get right, get back to the covenant and the like. But Jehoiakim, the king, was 20, this is verse 5, 20 and 5 years old, we began to reign. He did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember that there were, uh, we're in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 5. There were three deportations. Three times Nebuchadnezzar came down and, and he off they'd go. It takes some. He went down and off they'd go. And he'd come down and off they'd go. Now, the significance of some of this. When he came down the first time, who did he take back with him? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we're at a point in history that is pivotal because other historical books of the Bible are going to come, uh, come into being after this time. And he comes down and he takes back Ezekiel. Both Daniel and Ezekiel lived in, uh, in uh, the deportation. And also we've got uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther that are going to be part of this. And they fit right where they are in the Bible historically. As a matter of fact, after 2 Chronicles 36, what's the very next book? Ez Ezra. And uh, there's a connection there historically. It flows right to this point. Then all of a sudden it starts flowing again to this point. Now we're here and the red light's on. I, I have not meant to wax eloquent this, um, this morning, but I just feel good. I've, I've enjoyed it. Okay. It's not that I don't enjoy it other times, but at other times it's more, more difficult. Especially, you know, at times. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll stop before I put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> have to have a note written here, too. Please excuse, Pastor. <laughs> okay, oh, where am I? All right, then verse um, uh, 8, last part of the verse. Or let's go to verse 7. He came down, Nebuchadnezzar carried the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon, put them in his temple. Now, what's going to happen is Nebuchadnezzar is going to take the treasures. He's going to come back down and he's going to destroy the temple. He's going to come back down and he's going to destroy Jerusalem. And what's going to happen then after the captivity of Babylon is over? He's going to let people go uh, and he's going to build the temple. He's going to build Jerusalem and he's going to get the treasures of the temple back. But th these are future books. That's what Daniel and Ezekiel and some of these other prophets ha have to do with. Here we are in history, and what's happening right here is he's taking, he's coming down in three different deportations of Jews off the land, and he's taking other things with him, people and instruments. Now, Jehoiakim, verse number eight, last part. His son reigned in his stead. Last part of verse nine. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so uh, it, it goes on down to Zedekiah begins reigning. Verse 12, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he humbled himself not before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. Now Jeremiah was also one that was now in existence at this time, and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to come back to these major prophets and see that some of them preached to the northern kingdom, that there was a coming deportation. Some of them preached to the southern kingdom, 
that there was a, a deportation coming and that they better be ready. Here is Jeremiah. But he also rebelled against the king. He stiffened his neck and he hardened his heart and turning unto the Lord of Israel. And so what happened? Last part of, of verse number 16. They mocked his messengers, despised his words, misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy.